Um, I guess that one's an easy one. Um, my dad, who showed me like, and then when I got big enough, that one and this one, and then this. <clears throat> so that was my alphabet for a while. Um, and then 50s rock and roll, initially. That was my thing. I liked Elvis and Chuck Berry and that kind of thing. So I learned lots of songs by those guys. And in terms of lead playing, all the usual suspects would be Cream era, Eric Clapton, Hendrix, George Harrison, I guess. And the one name that nobody ever drops, but they, they should, they would if they knew about it, was Al Clemenson from the Alex Harvey Band. It was a huge influence because I'm half Scottish, so I grew up with a heightened awareness of like, the, the Billy Connollys and Alex Harveys of the world. And I guess Zal was probably my Jimmy Page. Hi, Paul. Um, I completely relate to this. I'm still finding new stuff. Um, perversely for me, sometimes it's kind of old, simple stuff that I find myself discovering. Um, now, this isn't particularly old or simple, but I, I had no idea about XTC until about a year ago, and now I'm a huge fan. Um, <clears throat> normally people get into things like XTC before they get into things like Frank Zappa, I would imagine, but I'm the wrong way around. What causes it? I don't know. I think we need a balanced musical diet. Um, Sometimes we get kind of engrossed in a certain genre and maybe OD on that, and there's some kind of vitamin imbalance in our capacity to enjoy music, and we just know that we're craving something else that our normal listening fodder isn't providing us. So I think maybe you just become more receptive to a certain thing that particular genres of music might have to offer, and you kind of find yourself looking for that. Also, traveling. I think traveling is really good for kind of opening your ear and exposing you to different things. Um, going to Turkey, for instance, helped me to discover a lot of details about Turkish music, which I would have spent the rest of my life not knowing had I not gone there. So sometimes it's good to experience music in its intended context. In the same way, I think there's certain stuff that you only really get when you go and see them live for the first time. The latter, I think, um, I think it's the seedling that that happens at the start of a song's, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure what the word is, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's got to start with a tiny idea that's compelling in its own right. And if you can c contemplate that tiny idea and know somehow, this is a, a good enough idea that it warrants me just putting in all the time it needs until it can become the song that I think it deserves to become until it blossoms. Um, after that point, sometimes you just have to persevere. You have to be prepared to try out different things and work hard and all that. But also you have to let that initial idea tell you where it wants to go. So if, if the, the foundations are good enough, sometimes the rest will write itself if you are prepared to apply yourself. I wish I knew. <laughs> Seriously, uh, the new solo album has been this ongoing promise for so long now. I, I've just abandoned the idea of promising people it will definitely be out by the end of this year or the end of this decade. I don't know. The truth is it'll be ready whenever it's ready. <clears throat> and whenever I think I have an album to present to the, the listening public, which is better than its predecessor and different from its predecessor because I don't see it, see the point in making the same album twice. So it's quite conceivable the next Aristocrats album will come out before the next solo album, but we'll see. I don't know where to begin. I think every time you do anything musically, you learn something from it. Um, you don't always put a name to it. Um, I don't kind of do that thing that they do at the end of a South Park episode. I think we all learn something today, and then they encapsulate what that thing is that they've learned. Um, 
a lot of my kind of experience in the world of music doesn't really have words to go with it. Um, you just kind of accumulate experience, and in, in some cases, I think I cheapen an experience by trying to express it. Um, but let me think: what what have I learned playing with all these people? Um, I guess mostly it's just one big thing, which is learning that it's not all about me and that it's about using the stuff that I can do to enrich someone else's music. How can I best serve the song? And things like that. You can't describe the instincts that you develop just by working more and more with different people and figuring out how to read what it is that they're trying to coax out of you. But hopefully it's just something that comes more naturally as you do more and more of it. I've had more specific input into this. Um, key differences, I mean, some things will obviously stay the same because they're just my genuine preference, independent of which company is making stuff. Um, the pickups are custom made. Um, this, this new bridge, this is a departure for me. It's the original um, Floyd Rose with no fine tuners. Uh, so I don't have the locking nut part of it, I just use the fact that it locks at the bridge, which helps tuning stability when I'm doing the big bends and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> other than that, the neck joint is different. Uh, it's a different approach to the same basic goal of trying to make make the joint feel transparent once you're up at the top, but, which seems to have worked. Um, other than that, this kind of jack socket input it's obviously a different thing because in real life you generally plug the lead in there and then you want to hook it around the strap so the lead doesn't come out if you step on the if you step on it on stage and also sometimes when you're just lounging around you want the guitar to be there and the nice thing about the cable coming out like this is it doesn't get in the way so there are more potential playing positions at your disposal and also the headstock, that's all I'm saying. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Is it close to the... Oh, I have another thing. There are graphite rods in the neck to make it even more stable. Is that close mm. to the final design now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just... Well, I've, I've discovered that these guys are very, very responsive to any input I might have to offer. Any stupid suggestion I make, they seem to take it seriously. So I'm enjoying that luxury at the moment and coming up with tiny little details just to see if they'll do it. And they will, it would seem. Uh, also, this arm attachment, this is the original non-screw collar arm attachment. And I'm trying this out because it feels incredible. There's no play or clunking between the down and the up whatsoever. So it will gargle for days. But my self-assigned mission right now is to see if I can break it and so wish me luck with that <laughs> I'm just kind of idiot testing everything that could possibly go wrong before we unleash this guitar on the unsuspecting public all of it really um, when I was a lot younger I would I, I never really had a practice routine where I would kind of get the the metronome thing happening and do exercises that I, I never had the attention span for that but I would sit there and just put on a record and then play along with it and sometimes I would be trying to pick out certain stylistic things that I heard happening on the actual record you know if you jam along with an Ingve record for long enough it, you're gonna start doing things like that just because you're hearing that kind of tonality and that kind of note distribution and you it kind of infects you in some subtle way, which was kind of the idea, just to let stuff osmose into the way I play rather than trying to steal anything specific and then practice one lick over and over again. Um, but yeah, always I've just tried to play what I hear in my head and that's really what improvising is, isn't it? It's like playing what you hear in your head and allowing the music you hear in your head to be informed by what you hear everyone else doing around you in any musical context. No, I, I, I would worry if a technique ever came first. 
Um, to me, the sound comes first. It's like I want to hear something percussive or like maybe I would end up slapping if it started with something I heard in my head that had a percussive vibe. Or if I want to hear something fluid, maybe I'd do a tapped kind of arpeggio. And if I wanted something more abrasive and staccato, maybe I'd play the same notes, but sweet picking or something like that. Always the sound comes first. The technique is just there to serve you, I think. So I've never tried to shoehorn a technique in to a piece of music just so I'd have a vehicle through which to let people know I could do that technique.